questions, and then I really want to take questions from the audience before we run out of time. We always try to end by 1 p.m. Uh, if we run over and you need to leave at uh, 1 o'clock, please just quietly get up and go. But otherwise, um, if, if it's going strong at 1 o'clock, we'll keep going. Um, I would ask that you, if you uh, hold applause until the end, just out of, uh, just for keeping time to uh, as much time as possible. Even though I know we're going to get answers that make us want to make us jump up and down, um, please hold it till the end if you can. So, today we will be hearing the opinions of the two candidates for the mayor of the city of Lakeland. The candidates are incumbent mayor Bill Mutz and his challenger Saga Stephen. I would like to remind the candidates as well as the audience of the rules of the forum. Each candidate will get two minutes for opening statements. We will then go into a series of questions and you will have 90 seconds to answer each question. We do have a timekeeper. Ricky, will you raise your hand? Ricky right there is our timekeeper. So with 90 seconds, when you have 30 seconds left, he's gonna wave at you. And then if you hit the, if you hit the 90 seconds and time is up, that's what you'll hear. Right. Time is up. It. And uh, when we finish with the questions, you'll have one minute for closing statements and then we will take questions from the audience. So uh, the candidates are gonna answer questions from the table. I'm gonna ask questions from here. Um, when, we, when we get started, just ask that you stand up. Um, I think both your mics are working. Um, and so we'll get started with opening statements and Saga, ladies first, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all so much for having me here. This is quite an honor. Um, so just a brief introduction about me. I was born in Lakeland. Well, I'm sorry, I was not born in Lakeland. I was raised in Lakeland. I was born in Hollywood, Florida. Raised in Lakeland, and I graduated Kathleen. So I lived here uh, all my life growing up. My dad was with public supermarkets from the time they had like a handful of stores. For many, many decades, he and three friends started the Public's Credit Union. My mother, Candy Packett, has been selling real estate here since the 70s, a very long time. After graduating from Kathleen, I was with up with people and toured the world as a lead dancer. And that really opened up a lot of doors for me and a lot of opportunities for me. And the thing that really pushed that for me was in Lakeland, I got such a strong sense of myself. I got strong conservative values. I got strong uh, schooling. I got, and, and Lakeland was really my foundation. It was what made me me. It offered me the opportunity to spread my wings and fly. And I've had a very big life. I've lived a lot of places. I've traveled the world. Um, most recently, I was living in Minneapolis for 24 years. Two years ago, my dad passed away. Mom wanted us back. So we came back, especially after what happened in Minneapolis last year. It was a rather easy decision to make. So we came back, and um, as I'm driving around Lakeland with my mom looking at things, I'm seeing things that reminded me of Minneapolis 10 and 15 years ago. And that's what prompted me to run, and I'm sure we'll get more into that later. Uh, but in any event, this is my home. I feel like a mama bear about Lakeland. I love Lakeland. I want to keep Lakeland Lakeland and do everything I can. Okay, I'm getting away. Thank you. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Bill. Hi, I'm Bill Mutz, and I am I'm grateful for the unanticipated opportunity to serve as mayor because that wasn't anything I had originally ever sought, but it has been a really marvelous experience the last four years. Um, and I think one of the things I think I'd just like to cover this time is to tell you what our goals were as mayor and as a commission, and that that is really kind of where we are today and where I would go going forward. But the first thing was to establish mutual trust and respect as a commission, because we've had some times where that wasn't always the case, and so I think we worked hard to do that. We built trust and cooperation between staff and the commission, which is also important. You have to work well with the city staff and with the city managers in order to make that work. Uh, we decided to avoid kicking the can down the road, which means we wanted to work on what came before us and to work on the items that needed attention. Uh, we made it a goal to strive to honor everyone. And that can sound nebulous, but it's hugely important because you're not a city of just what you necessarily 
think about and where you represent yourself in your city for all people, and you have to represent their interests broadly. We worked to grow jobs with emphasis on high skill, high wage, and technology, which we have done very effectively, and we've provided manufacturing and housing incentives to help grow that, and we'll continue to do so. Protecting quality of life was hugely important to us, so how do we support fire and make sure that our pay raise rates are right? How do we support police and make sure that we get the contracts so that they are as supported and eliminate level, levels for recruiting so that we can bring people in more easily, and that became extremely important to us. Um, while doing all that, maintaining taxes or lowering them. And how do you do that? By controlling costs. And also, what did we do with respect, with respect to homeless? That's an area we'll probably talk about, but that became an important thing for us to engage. Uh, we accelerated to get 500 plus homeless, I'm sorry, affordable homes built, and we got that job done and um, then expand the airport and its uses. So those were all early priorities. Thank you both. So I just want to point out that the timekeeper moved. Oh. Okay, he's over here, he's over here now. I don't want you to sit looking over there going over five minutes. <laughs> all right, first question is about body cameras for Lakeland Police Department. So just over a week ago, our city commission approved the budget for 2022 that included money for body cameras for LPD. Um, Bill, we know that you voted in favor of the budget. So the question for you is, is, can you explain why you voted the way you did? And for Saga, the question is gonna be, can you tell us how you would have voted and why? Bill, you're first. Body cameras are the number one issue of our uh, African-American community in Lincoln. Uh, so when we went on the listening binge last summer, to hear some of the things that we could learn from what we saw on the national agenda. Body camera use was here, and everything else that we discussed and could address was in this range. Uh, the reason for that is very, very simple. It is less about recording a major event like we might see typically on a body camera. It is more about daily accountability when you're stopped as a citizen within the city. So that we, so that there is a sense of if I get stopped, someone who it may be different uh, ethnically is going to be stopped with the same kind of treatment and that that occurs. There are costs associated with this, but this is not a new agenda item. This agenda item has been four years in terms of a plea to go forward and make this decision. And so if we're going to, to make certain that we provide the kind of equity among the community that is necessary, we voted for that and I believe it'll be the technological integration going forward and there are other reasons that we built it into the budget now. All right, thank you. Saga? Hi, the short answer is no, I would not vote for body cameras. Um, this is a hot topic. I know that it was originally number 16 on your list and got bumped up to number one. Um, in doing research, it was a lot of Black Lives Matter push on it. So I started digging. I'm a data person. I'm a medical person. I dig, dig, dig for data. What I found was the first thing that would happen with body cameras is you, every one of you, would have to give up your privacy. Because if you are a victim of a crime, whether it is a abuse case, rape case, whatever, the cops come in, they have a camera on. That's one thing. You have a horrific crime scene, your parents, whoever, get whatever, walk in, body camera, crime. Because of the Freedom of Information Act, that film can be requested and shared. The other part is, is uh, informants aren't gonna come talk to a cop with body camera. If you are the witness to a crime, you're not gonna come talk to a cop if there's any kind of retaliation. So that's a large consideration. The data shows nationwide, okay, thanks, I'll talk really fast. Data shows nationwide 14% more agitation for cops even the ACLU is very hesitant about these because of the soft search warrants. Um, the cost, to give you an example, Boston Department, 11 million the first year, 30 million the second year, I'm sorry, 30 million the third year. The costs are unknown. I even uh, assume, I, I heard, that you budgeted 1 million for whatever and the costs are unknown going forward. So in the city of Lakeland, in the past five years, there was only 16 verified incidents where these may have helped. So I don't think that Lakeland is a candidate for it right now. I would have voted no. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next question is property taxes. So in that same budget vote, the city commission reduced property taxes. However, 
they did not reduce them enough to meet the rollback rate. What the rollback rate is, is the rate that is needed to bring in the same amount of revenue from the previous year. Some people think that this actually constitutes a property tax increase. So can you both explain your stance on the property tax rate in the next fiscal year in the saga that you're first? Hello. Okay, property taxes. Oh, it was like running a race on the last one. The property taxes, um, and I know it goes by millage rate, and there's a lot of different variables in there. I am not fully up to speed on that. What I would do, it's like in my house, if you say, Sag, I want you to decrease your spending. I know in my house what we decrease. What I plan to do when I get in is to go to each department head and say, where do you see you could decrease? Because there's got to be something happening somewhere. If everybody's decreasing, I mean, look what happened last year with, I mean, jobs and everything. So if the city keeps increasing cost of this, cost of this, cost of this, of course they're going to go up. We're not going to be able to afford things. The decrease, I think we need to take a hard look and dig down deeper into some of the issues and some of the things surrounding that. So that would be one of my first things, is to really dig with the department heads, with the staff. I would ask a lot of questions of staff. They seem to be controlling a lot of things. Property taxes are not the full rollback rate because they're valued at the 11% appreciation in property value that we have just experienced, which we don't anticipate sustaining. So when we create a budget, we have to create a budget that anticipates what that future military rate would be. So that in includes a reduction going forward that would then make it, and could have make it impact a reduction overall. Property taxes are one third of the way we pay our bills in Lakeland, one third. Our property rates are uh, the lowest in, in the area surrounding us in Polk County. They're lower than Mulberry, and the quality of life is dramatically different. So property taxes are sustained and subvened at a lower level because of Lakeland Electric and because of the effectiveness of our enterprise uh, operations within the city. So I think the rate that we did, which actually lowered a, a tenth of a, month, a millage point in the reduction, which is our second reduction from the rate, is reflective of the fact that we didn't want to see them increase and is reflective of the 1.5% that we kept all departments on in increases in expenses, which is significant because that's less than the um, inflation rate. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Next question. Um, I, I personally have lived in Lakeland since 1973. I'm a proud Drake Mountain Saga. I've stolen your <laughs> So, and I'm honestly, since that time, since I lived here, since I was a kid, I have heard my whole life that there's a homeless problem in downtown Lakeland. Literally, since 1973. I'm not saying whether there is or there isn't. However, um, Bill, you've been mayor for four years, and so I want the question for you is going to be, can you tell us what the city has accomplished on your watch and what you would like to accomplish in the next four years? And for Saga, can you tell us, number one, if there is an issue, and if there is, what would you like the city to do about it? We, there's a point in time count on homelessness in our city every January, and that reduction has been 200 people since uh, we came in to uh, this particular such a, um, my server. We hired two case managers to assess the homeless population so that we could pull out the people that needed to have mental health treatment, pull out the people that really were just trying to work off the system, and to reduce the amount of comfort in being homeless in Lakeland and make it less part of what we wanted to tolerate. And we couldn't have homelessness in every city. And we have chronic people who have no interest in doing anything but being homeless, and who aren't mental health issues, and want to want to hang around downtown. Then we also have about four people who are pretty aggressive homeless people in our city that we work all the time. We've assigned an LPD officer that does nothing but work full time downtown. LDBA is currently looking at an opportunity to be able to add a security officer that would work for sometimes to support that in the evening. And I will, and, and we have great not-for-profits who have helped to support that as well. And so it will continue to be a problem, it's continue to be an issue, and it's one that we'll keep in the forefront, but it is hard to be a perfect world. True, well said. Um, 
There is a homeless problem. I don't believe that it's totally government's job to take care of the homeless problem. In San Diego, they've done a beautiful job in helping uh, decrease that through bridge programs. We have fabulous nonprofits here that do help with the homeless overnight, which is great. They can't do something during the day. That's where a bridge program is needed. Uh, I also understand that good news, bad news, good news, Lakeland Regional is fabulous with mental health issues and indigent issues. So my understanding is a lot of cities from around Florida give their people a one-way ticket here. Then they get out and we get them. I think they should be given a round-trip ticket. And once we take care of them through the hospital, we should be able to send them back to their home because it shouldn't be our problem on our tax dollars. So I think there's a lot to look at, and I think also working within the community. Our community does a fabulous job, Lighthouse, Talbot House, things like that. Let's look at others that can also bridge and do a bridge program for the homeless. Thank you, that was, that was two good answers. I, I did wanna ask this, I just, this was not a plan, but I wanna ask, ask really anybody, does anybody know the answer to this? Because again, going back to 1973, I've heard this premise that other cities give their homeless people tickets to Lakeland. Is there any real evidence? Can anybody answer? Is there evidence of that or not? This used to be a big issue here. Uh, it is not today. And so that, and, and one of the reasons it's not is because we, it's less hospitable here for that. Um, not for profit hospitals are required to do indigent care. And if you're homeless and you get in the hospital and have a reason to be there, it's a nice place to be able to stay with hot meals three times a day. So we have to be careful on that side too because of the fact that it's, we don't want to be too hospitable, but we want to certainly care about people and legitimate health needs. All right, next, you want to respond or? I think you did great. Okay, I just, to be honest, I mean, that's just a, a question for me. I don't know the answer to this, if it's right or wrong. But I do want to follow up again. It's like moving the Greyhound station out of downtown, did that help? No? <laughs> making, making the city less hospitable for homeless is what helps. And, you know, recently we have, at Munn Park, we took all the plugs off the base of the lights so that you can't charge your phone there. We have to start to do really practical little things. Um, you change water cycles on sprinkling, things like that. And so um, you, you, it, it's important for us to think about how we make our parks, our citizens' parks, while okay. we also observe people's rights. Fair enough. Sure. And, and you are right about that, to make it less hospital for the homeless, but you also don't want to infringe on the citizens and the good citizens that use that. And the people that live downtown, the businesses there, we help the homeless, we help the businesses. It's a win-win. Um, again, I plan on looking into what San Diego did to really drop their homeless rate, homelessness rate by using the bridge programs. So, and I think, you know, again, it's something that community can help with. Great. Let's move on to a different topic. Let's talk about broadband. <clears throat> so in July, the city entered it into a 10-year agreement with Summit Broadband to provide high-speed internet services to Lakeland residents using the existing fiber optic network, which is owned by the city, as the backbone of the service. Can you tell us what you hope the benefits of that would be 10 years from now, or if you were against it, that, you know, that as well? So I mean, you're first. Hi, this is interesting. Um, I was actually going to a meeting and I bumped into the gentleman that brought it here and he was bragging about how great he did and what all he did. And my first question was to him was, awesome. How many jobs did you bring to Lakeland? Anyone guess the answer? None. He's using people from India. So I think if the city of Lakeland is going to support somebody that's gonna bring in a very huge and very expensive program, it should be attached to jobs for Lakelanders. So as far as how it's gonna be in 10 years, that, that remains to be seen, I don't know. Um, as far as what it's gonna do, power-wise, that also remains to be seen. It sounds great, a lot of things sounds great, but I guess we'll find out soon enough. So we had 327 miles of dark fiber in our city that was done by our utility about 12 years ago, and this is an opportunity to be able to utilize it. When we do an RFP, we do it so we can control our costs to the lowest cost, cost possible, and we want the maximum service for that RFP which some at one and one handily and, and, are, and are using that dark fiber in almost every area that they can. There's some places where we were a little tight and they need to run some more. Um, the goal is to have people employed because of the gig of city that it creates for us. We are a, we are a nation that is gonna to continue to, to employ Internet of Things increasingly at a rate like this. So what we currently utilize for Internet capability is nothing 
compared to what we'll even do three years from now, including autonomous vehicles and our guidance down streets. So for us to be in a position to be able to grow technologically and attract businesses that can expand here, which is the thing they're going to be interested in as we bring jobs, uh, we have to have that. And we didn't do it at the city's expense, which was the original thrust, which could have been a cost of several hundred of millions of dollars. Instead, we have income coming from it. All right, thank you both. Um, next topic is going to be permitting and the permitting department in the city. So uh, I kind of think this is similar to homelessness. That there, whether there is or isn't a problem is not what I'm suggesting. But there's absolutely is a perception in the city of Lakeland that it's extremely difficult to get things permitted um, to build in, in the city. And you hear the stories, and these are from friends that have actually experienced it, that they go down and they get permitting, and then when the inspector comes out, it just says something totally opposite of what they were told at City Hall. So um, the question is, what really for Bill, you've already been in office for four years, and then Saga, you're gonna get, you know, what would you do about it? But, you know, here we are, whether it's true or not, the perception is there, and is there anything we can do about that? Um, I really believe this is an area where staff has made great inroads. Uh, they measure at the metrics of this all the time in terms of the amount of time between a, a, a request and the permit, and then they measure the time between permits and extent and, and inspections. It is a hard balance because if you work through the plans of design and review and do what you say you're going to do in the building, you're going to go quickly. If there is, if there are some shortcuts or there are some differences between that approved engineering plan, it's going to be an interim. That's why we have inspectors. Um, we we uh, need them because not always do, does everybody do everything that they are supposed to do. All in all, I think it is a place where we can applaud the building department and they've made improvements and the rate of that improvement increases, not slides. And I think uh, five years, six years ago, it was pretty bad. And so um, Nicole Travis is very much responsible for that. She made a huge difference. All right, Sonia. All right, in that my mom is in the real estate world, I have heard a little bit about this. Um, this goes back to my thing about let's dig into the staff and let's find the staff. I know we were going to develop a property and we went into the first meeting and there was numerous people around. And what we found out was actually it was a very large mistake made. And the mistake made was the people that were had their plans on the property next to ours actually planned to use our property as drainage. So that's confiscation. I don't know if the same kind of thing happens in, and it's an honest mistake, I know. The city took care of it. It's an honest mistake. But in building and planning and getting things through, the more layers of people you have, the more opportunity there are for mistakes, the more opportunity there are for things. Again, I plan on going in and talking with them and seeing if we can whittle this down and get it a little bit more streamlined. I'm sure you all have done a great job in the past five years. Let's continue on that road and whittle it down and see if we can get to the heart of it because the staff, you know, yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, it's on now, so. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, next topic is Lakeland Electric. So, you know, as you know, we're shutting down, or, or we have shut down one of the generators. There are some layoffs uh, in process of employees. And so, you know, what I would ask is just it's a fairly generic question is, is what is your vision of, of uh, Lakeland Electric moving forward over the next 10 to 20 years? So I'll be here at first. Hi. Okay, Lake and Electric. First of all, you all need to realize how fabulously lucky we are to own our own electric company. This is great. It is, it is so fabulous because that also helps keep our taxes down. The other thing you have to realize is Lake and Electric is getting uh, pressured from federally about green. green, 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 green energy, green energy. So that's one factor. If you want to know the truest, most green and efficient effective energy, it's nuclear. Nuclear is very, very expensive. So I actually think Joel's been doing a really good job, Joel Ivey, in paring down the staff, working with expenses and all. And now I know that we had to shut down the coal, but going toward a, a mixed use with the uh, um, gas, gas powered, uh, propane powered energy. So that's a good sign. I don't think we could afford nuclear. However, you wanna keep, in my opinion, and I have data on this, 
As far as the windmill, well, you can't crank up the wind if you need power. As far as solar, you can't crank up solar power if you need solar. The energy you can crank up is the propane, is the coal, and of course is the nuclear. All right. So I agree with Saga 100% on everything she just said. And Joel is a wonderful leader. He's not only a leader for us in the city, but nationally. He serves on the municipal power committee that, um, and is super highly respected. We're the, the coal, uh, unit three was our coal, gigantic one on the back of Lake Park that you see with the conveyors and the coal. That is completely closed now. And that is a wonderful admin. It's a 47 year old machine that took three days to heat up the capacity to create power. And we're replacing it with six rice engines that are in a row and they don't all have to run at the same time. They can run individually so that they take 30 seconds to produce power. Um, like propane, they're naturally gas motivated and they're all uh, and empowered and they're also convertible to hydrogen. So when we get hydrogen cell, the same engines will stay in place. They weigh 137,000 pounds an engine. An engine. So the building is built first and then you bring them in and set them up. Then the putting them in series and making them available to do to meet peak load demands is, is precisely what we need to do. And we do solar to the extent that it's practical and affordable because right now solar wouldn't be producing any energy. And that's the afternoons in Florida. And you think, oh, we're in Florida, we should have solar power everywhere. It doesn't work that way. And batteries are a big requirement of that. And as battery costs go down, it will become more practical and we'll integrate that as we go. All right, thank you. So we're gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna take closing statements and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. So get your audience questions ready to go. Don't be afraid to ask tough questions, okay? That one of these two people is gonna be our next mayor. So here's the final question and uh, Bill, you're gonna go first. So the final question is, what is the most positive thing you have to say about your opponent? Super nice. <laughs> um, and so uh, I think it's wonderful to live in a city where you can uh, enjoy meeting the people that you're gonna run uh, with. And she has a history in the city. She has, uh, she went to Kathleen High School for a lot of people, that's a good thing, okay. And, and, um, and uh, I am really uh, grateful for the opportunity to run alongside someone who has that kind of collegiality. Well, thank you very much. It's very, very kind. And actually, even before I met you in person, which was not that long ago, one thing I know is you're a good man with a good heart. And I can just tell that from what you've done before, what you've said before, and, and the different things you're doing. So that would that would be my biggest thing. Is I honestly believe you are a good man with a good heart. See what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go to closing statements for you one minute. And so, Saga, we're going to let you go first in closing statements, and then Bill, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. All right. Um, in closing, people ask me why I want to run for mayor and what my standard answer is because I lived in Minneapolis the past 24 years and I witnessed the systemic destruction of a once great and beautiful town. And that is true. And when I came to Lakeland and we were driving around, I'm starting to see these same infractions. And what happened in Minneapolis is really good-hearted people trying to do the right thing got plagued by very smart activists. And it's crushing. And I see that here. And it's very, very sad because Black Lives Matter has been invited to be a stakeholder in the city of Lakeland. We now have two Black Lives Matter candidates running for city commissioners. I, it's kind of like if you have been down whatever road you can see there and somebody just starting down that road may or may not see it, so you want to warn them. So I have no problem if anybody comes in asking really hard questions, if anybody comes in wanting to do with my town under the guise of social or racial injustice. I think hard questions need to be asked and I think it needs to come to us out. All right, Bill. I love the opportunities that we have ahead of us. I think Lakeland's best days are ahead and I believe we're at a cusp moment in terms of continuing the wonderful work that is being done. Listening to all parties within the city is our responsibility of government. And so um, when we did our listening tour, certainly including the interests of what Black Lives Matter wanted to accomplish in our city was important, which was two tenets. One, which is that there would be 
training for small businesses, minority businesses, and the others that we would work on minority financing. Those are the only two tenants that have ever been requested or asked and, and what we are working on delivering. Uh, it's less about the organizations and it's less about the national agenda that we need to fear and it's far more about our local opportunities in front of us and making sure that we're caring about people and we're making those opportunities available to as broadly as we possibly can. Not everyone has initiative. Not everybody wants to be served and to do things, but for people who have their hand in the air, who want to grow, who want to have opportunity, that's what we can do. And we have so many factors in this city in place and so many opportunities to work with people who care about the future and about tomorrow. That's what energizes me. When I come home at night and see what we're able to get going and what's gonna be happening and, and the new jobs and opportunities that come, that's what rings my bell. And so if that is something that I can continue to provide, I'd be delighted to do so. All right, thank you very much. So before we start questions, I wanna um, just say thank you both very much for being here. Um, I admire anybody who is willing to stick their neck out for public service because it's not easy. So before we start questions, I just want to say, you know, whichever one is our next mayor, we're going to have a good mayor. I feel pretty, pretty confident in that. Let's give him a round of applause. So we are going to take questions. And so the, the mic that's normally in the audience is up here being used by Bill. So I would ask if you have a question, please stand up and speak loudly and enunciate your question so everybody in the room can hear it. And so we're going to start taking questions. Anybody? Bob English? Just yell, Bob. Just yell. We don't have a mic out there. When you're mayor, are you going to admit that that diet road on Florida Avenue is the Okay, Saga has an answer. Yes. Bill? Uh, it's, it's called the Dixieland realign, lane, lane realignment by FDOT. Um, we have till June 2022 to determine that. And so that's what it's about. It's a test and it's funded by the state and we'll be able to make an assessment in June. And I think that's a right thing for us to wait to do because COVID has reduced some of the traffic that we have. We really want to have it be a full complement of traffic. Uh, to see how it goes. It would require additional tweaks in terms of some left turn uh, options that would be utilized if it is kept. Uh, but I think it's still something we should measure. And I understand, Bob, the, and, and recognize when, if it were done, if it were approved, then that all becomes one sidewalk. There's not little blocks. There's pavers and intersections. It, there's trees with landscape poles so that that brings a whole pedestrian corridor to Dixieland. Which is one of the secondary benefits. Do you want to follow up, Sarah? I will definitely follow up. Um, that's all lovely having big sidewalks and all that kind of fun stuff. The part that's not so lovely are the neighborhoods all around there that are now getting new traffic and people going through there and they have speed humps. And it's like, again, do the data, 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 data. Did anybody question the neighborhoods? Did anybody question around there? There's a lot of businesses there that are now closed down. I think a lot of data needs to be done before you take four lanes and make it two. All right. So, wait, so the good, good news on the data, which you'll like, is that we Bluetoothed every street all the way across in the grid before we ever started the project currently, and we'll be part of what we measure at the end. So we know every power count every day on every street that has a Bluetooth vehicle in it, uh, unit in it. All right, Billy, I saw your hand up first. Uh, one clarification, real quick, I Thank you. 
All right. So as far as names, name names, I know Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. I know the Democratic Socialists of America are Democratic organizations. I don't know the names of all the members here in town. I also do know that George Soros has a lot of dark money. He's bought 370, I believe, uh, companies across the U.S., 19 of which are in Polk County. I do know that Lakeland does have a target on its back because Lakeland being the largest city in Polk County, Polk County the largest county in the state, they figure they, being the dark money funded people, figure if they can take Lakeland, they can take the county, they can take the state, they can take the U.S. So infractions, well, let me see. I think our freedoms have been attacked. Um, moving a monument to me is silly. So going from four lanes to two, um, the closing the parks, closing churches, closing things like that. There's been a lot of different infractions. Um, uh, attacks, well, there was the riot last year. It started out as a peaceful protest. We do know the difference between a peaceful protest and a riot. The riot is when they destroy cars and they destroy things and cops have to show up with guns and tear gas and things like that. So yes, they are here. I don't have the personal names of everybody. I do know the organizations, a lot of them like to keep a little bit personal and kind of under the radar. However, I do know people that are on top of it. When I spoke with Grady, uh, he filled me in on a lot of things going on. So yes, it is here. Doris? To maintain the RP funding center. RP funding center has a target budget to lose two and a half million dollars in fiscal year 22. It's lost six million dollars at its worst point during COVID. Uh, RP funding center brings somewhere between 15 to 30 million dollars of economic activity to Lakeland a year. Funding centers nationally don't make money. So to move it towards break to where we can break even. Uh, is a win, um, and it requires programming changes, and that's the biggest thing that we have to work on, uh, Ms. Bailey, is to get those changes put into place. And so um, we're encouraged, but it's on our radar, frankly, uh, because we want to make sure that we, when we're struggling for money in lots of other places, we hate to lose two and a half million at one place. Remember it, it's restaurants, it's people in beds, in hotels, it's all the activity of com uh, people coming to Lakeland. Some people will end up living here because they came to Lakeland over the years and they liked what they saw when they were here. So it is always something that we have to work to balance, but it is, in fact, we're going to have a workshop on it and with the commission in a couple of weeks just to talk about how we can sharpen our pencils a bit more. Saga, would you like to address that? I think he did a fabulous job addressing it, and if there's a workshop coming up, again, it's something that needs to be looked into. It's like anything else. I think there's a lot of things in the city of Lakeland that really need to be dug into. Deeper, deeper, deeper. The more you peel back the layers, the more you learn. So that's, I agree with what you say, and the workshop should be great. Okay. Shandell. For the people who don't know Shandell, he's running for city commission. <laughs> I think everybody knows him, but he's probably knocked on the door at least once. Just to let everyone know regarding the body cameras, uh, can't hear you. Just to let everyone know regarding the body cameras uh, and the, uh, the recall for the Black Lives Matter. One by the cameras. That's not true. It's more than that. It's the neighborhood associations within the minority communities. It's the uh, the NAACP within the minority communities, which have Caucasian, minority, and Hispanics that serve on that uh, association. So it's more to that. And regarding the privacy, there's legislation that can be written to protect you and your privacy. Uh, and that can take place within this jurisdiction in the local area in the state level to protect your privacy with the body camera. It's just for accountability. Yes, uh, with the body cameras, 
the software may be, have to be updated, but there are grants out there that support it. We didn't catch the grant on time, but I'm pretty sure that there is a proactive approach to make sure that we're on that grant program so uh, we can have the budgetary funds necessary to make sure we have those body cameras and to represent all the constituents within the city of Lincoln. Thank you. All right, we got time for one more question. And then we're gonna and we're gonna wrap it up. And Danica, your hand went up first. That's my Fabulous question. Repeat the question. Yeah, can you um, how to minimize polarization because there's been a lot of tribalism, et cetera, and so on over the past everywhere with everybody. Yeah, basically, how are you going to represent the people that don't believe the same way that you do? Right. And here's my thing I believe in equal opportunity for all. I do not believe in equity. I believe in equal opportunity. Equal opportunity does not mean equal outcome. If you're a really super hard worker and you have the same opportunity as somebody that's kind of lazy, you're going to win. That is the all-American way. We have our God-given inalienable rights and they're protected by the Constitution. We have the Bill of Rights, which tells us what the law and government cannot take away. So I support absolute 1,000% equal opportunity for all. I've been out talking to people that have started small businesses. I've been going to the farmer's market, I've been going out in the neighborhoods, I've been going everywhere. And I think that if you offer equal for everyone, I think that's a way to do it. I, you know, I went to Kathleen, and I know everybody makes fun of it. Oh, that's a farmer's boy, whatever. We still stole your boat. But in any event, I don't, I have never been a part of or witnessed or whatever. The polarization of people is now, and I truly believe that there's agitators coming to do that. Now you have, oh, vax versus unvax, mask, unmask, black, white, rich, poor, whatever. And again, we are all Americans, and in Lakeland, Lakeland's such a unique city. I love this city. Lakeland is fabulous, and I wanna keep Lakeland, Lakeland. I don't go out in the streets and witness, oh my goodness, there's you know, a, a whatever person. I mean, Lakeland's a lovely mix of people, and I think we're people that have American values, that want a traditional family kind of lifestyle, conservative views, and I think that that's, again, the equal opportunity totally go down the line with the Constitution, with our Bill of Rights. And I think the more we champion that and the more we express that, the better it is. All right, Bill? I um, concur on many points. I think we live in a time where polarization people hide within. Many times you ask someone, would you, after they may dump an opinion on you, would you like to know another opinion on that topic. Many times people will say, no, I have no interest in knowing another opinion on that topic. I learned to ask that question because there's no reason to spend any time on it if that's the case. But I do think in our city, we have more, uh, well, less polarization than in many, many places in the country. The country is hot with polarization. And that is, as Saga has said, one of the blessings of the city. What we have to teach our kids, remind ourselves, and make sure we're activating is to be collegial in discussion. We don't have to win everybody to our point of view. There are different perspectives in life. It is okay for someone to have a different perspective than your perspective. And in, when I grew up, I knew lots of people that thought quite differently than I thought that I really enjoyed and loved. Today, we put them on Facebook, throw them in another silo and say, go over there and stay there and don't talk to us anymore and talk to your friends and hit the echo chamber. That's not healthy. So I think if we if we just do what we are here and do it well, that's one of the things we can model and enjoy. And it starts by honoring everyone. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up. My fellow Kwanis, let's give them a proper thank you.